So we're now gonna start talking about the Java fork join framework, which is one of the most interesting examples of thread pools in Java, and as you'll see is widely used for other kinds of things that we won't talk a lot about in this class, but if you take the sibling course next fall, which is the parallel functional programming course, you'll get to learn all about how fork join framework is applied in that context. So let's talk about how the fork join framework is used to process tasks in parallel. So what is the fork join framework? Well, the fork join framework, and more specifically a fork join pool or a fork join thread pool, provides a high performance, fine grained task execution framework for so-called Java data parallelism. And we'll talk a bit about what that means in a second. As I alluded to a moment ago, the fork join pool is used as a parallel computing engine by other higher level frameworks that are part of modern Java, for example, parallel streams, for example, completable futures. You can also use it with other reactive programming frameworks like Project Reactor or RxJava. And if you want to learn all there is to know about the background of fork join, take a look at this interview with my good friend and colleague, Doug Lee, who wrote the fork join framework, and he has a nice description of how it all works and why it's cool, and it's really cool. So what the fork join pool does is it supports a divide and conquer style of parallel programming. And basically the way it works, is, as you undoubtedly know, because you probably learned about divide and conquer in other places like your algorithms and data structures courses in the context of algorithms like quick sort and merge sort and so on, divide and conquer works by taking the entire problem. And then if the problem is very small or if it's small enough, you solve the problem directly using some sequential algorithm. That's the that's called the basis case for the recursion. I'm sure you're familiar with that too. If the problem is bigger than some predefined limit, then split the problem into independent parts, two or more, fork new subtasks, solve each of these parts, two or more, and then join all the subtasks together and create a composite result from the various sub results. So that's the quick summary of how divide and conquer works in general, and then more specifically how it's applied in the context of the fork join framework. So what does that really mean in terms of how things work with, with Java and the Java fork join framework? So the fork method, which we will talk about in great detail, is used to split the overall task into subtasks. So you start with some source of data and then you fork it into a bunch of sub sources or subtasks. And the way it does that is by calling the fork method. Now, if you're doing things correctly, you want to be able to split the original data source, the original task into subtasks evenly and efficiently. And we'll talk a lot about that. That's really important. And you'll also see that this whole process is done recursively. So you split the original data source into subtasks, then you take those and you divide those into subtasks. And you keep going until you reach a uh, level at which you cannot subdivide it any further. You don't choose to subdivide it any further. And so the way to do that is you, you basically keep splitting until you get to a point where the result is too small to split any further. Uh, when something gets the size of one, that's usually a good time to stop because you can't subdivide that any further without ending up with partial stuff, which doesn't make any sense. Once you have split everything up into its atomic sized elements, then all those atomic sized subtasks are then processed in parallel as a unit, although any given subtask runs sequentially. And that's, that's a little bit confusing at first, but the point is you, once you get something to be atomically sized, you run that sequentially, but all those sequential subtasks run in parallel. And this is implemented using a combination of things. It uses the fork join framework. It uses the Java virtual machine or the Java execution environment. It uses operating system threads. There's typically a pool of threads. Obviously, eventually this gets mapped down to hardware cores. They're the things that are really doing the heavy lifting to run this stuff in parallel. <clears throat> and assuming you're on a multi-core processor, which most of us are these days, the subtask will run in parallel on the different cores. So each core will sequentially process a subtask, but 
taken together, all the cores will process all the subtasks in parallel. And as a general rule of thumb, the more cores you have, the faster things run. And that's the beauty of the fork joint framework. It's really trying to, try to take advantage of the fact that we have multiple cores, and if we do a clever job of scheduling, or if it does a clever job of scheduling on our behalf, then we can just keep making things run faster and faster. And I certainly see that with each new computer I get. So my, my new computer that I'm running today for my slides, it's, it's total overkill for slides, by the way, is a new MacBook Pro with the A1 Max, which has 10 cores and some ridiculous amount of memory and super duper optimized performance. So I'm really looking forward to rendering the videos later because it should go way faster than it did last week. So I'm excited about that. Now, if you happen to be trapped on a desert island and you've only got a laptop from the 1980s or 1990s, you may only have a single core. Um, and if that's the case, the Java, the Java fork joint framework will work. You just won't get a very big speed up because obviously one core is not as likely to give you a performance boost unless your subtasks are heavily I.O. bound. And we'll talk more about that later. But chances are you have a laptop with more than one core. Then the other thing that you'll do, or other key capability that's provided with the fork join framework is combining subtasks together using join. So join is the mechanism to join things. And join waits, I should put that word in quotes, for subtasks to finish. It actually does something very magical. It doesn't really wait in a blocking sense. It sort of logically waits. So we'll talk about that when the time is right. And because of the fact that join doesn't actually wait, it plays a role in executing subtasks as well. And we'll talk about how and why that works. It's really cool little optimization that they built into the fork join framework to make it work even faster and better on multi-core processors. The other thing that join does is it merges results from subtasks. So this, this of course occurs recursively. So you have join being called and then when you join stuff together, it'll merge the various pieces and you'll end up with a final result. So you get a bunch of partial results and then we get a final result by merging everything together. And that's the result that's returned back to the user. So that's why this is basically divide and conquer. You divide things up, you do a bunch of processing and then you merge everything back. It's also somewhat similar to the concept of map reduce, if you're familiar with the map reduce paradigm, which is very popular in distributed computing these days. And we'll talk later about the differences between what they do here with fork join and how map reduce works, but it's very much the same kind of idea. Joins occur in a single thread at a given level. And as a consequence of this, you don't have to have locking in your code that uses the fork join framework. That's another nice thing. There's no need for synchronization. So there's no need for synchronization during the joining phase. There's typically no need for synchronization during the forking phase. And this whole thing works by basically partitioning the data up into chunks where there's really little or no need for synchronization. And that's why this type of approach is most suited for so-called embarrassingly parallel processing tasks. And we'll talk more about that later. So that's the end of the overview of the Java fork join framework. Obviously, there's a lot more to it. This is just giving you the high level view of taking a data source and forking it up into subtasks and then ultimately joining the results of those subtasks back together to create a final composite result.